Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started just because uh, in the interest of time. Uh, good morning and welcome to the Center for Strategic International Studies. We've got a terrific briefing for you this morning. Um, we've got just about all of our experts uh, from Asia, you know, in the Asian region here. And as you can see, we have extremely deep expertise uh, in all the different areas. And I think uh, please, you know, don't hold back with your questions because uh, these guys have a lot to say. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Green. Uh, Mike Green is Senior Vice President at CSIS uh, for Asia, and he's also our Japan Chair. That, I'll give it to Mike. Uh, good morning. Thank. Can you hear me? Um, uh, good morning. Thanks for coming. So, um, the president is going uh, to Japan, Korea, Malaysia, and the Philippines. It's in Japan the 24th and 25th um, for a state visit, including a formal dinner with the emperor. Uh, Korea on the 25th, Malaysia 26, 27, and then the Philippines on the 28th. This trip is basically the um, the do-over trip after the president had to cancel last October his uh, visit to the region for the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation APEC Summit and the East Asia Summit because of the shenanigans back in Washington over the budget. Um, and in terms of the overall purpose, um, I think uh, the uh, White House and the administration are going to try to show that the so-called pivot or rebalance to Asia has legs and that the President's committed and, and uh, certainly getting the President to travel to the region goes a long way towards demonstrating that. Um, the good news, I think, for the president going out to the region uh, and the credibility of the uh, so-called rebalance to Asia is that uh, for the past several years, a majority of Americans in polls have said that Asia is the most important region to the United States for decades before uh, it was Europe. But now Americans get it, generally. Um, uh, you know, not too long ago when a president traveled to Asia, somebody in the Congress or the press would say, why is he going all the way to Asia? The American people get it, um, and that's clear in the polls. Um, the uh, Pentagon uh, seems to get it. The Navy is shifting 60% uh, of its surface combatants to the Pacific. The Air Force, over half of its fifth generation fighters. <clears throat> the Army has created a new uh, Army Corps that's going to be focused on the Pacific. So it's actually an existing Army Corps, First Corps, but it's going to be realigned to the Pacific. Um, the um, president's pretty popular in the region. Um, and everybody, uh, except perhaps North Korea, wants more engagement with the US military, wants more, more trade agreements with the US, um, and in particular, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, um, which was going nowhere a few years ago, is now the center of um, attention in Asia with respect to the trade and economic architectures. And we'll touch on all of this when my colleagues um, go. Let me just uh, mention the bad news for the President going out. Um, there are questions in the region, both in the media, but also within governments, particularly among allies, about American staying power and the credibility of American commitments. Um, a narrative has built after Syria, um, when the United States drew a red line and then ignored it. Uh, the Crimea, um, the defense budget cuts, um, questions uh, particularly in Japan, but elsewhere in the region about who's the go-to guy in the administration, who's this very senior person who, who's doing Asia in the way that Rich Armitage or uh, Hillary Clinton or Bob Zellick or others have in the past. And there's some confusion about the administration's narrative about the region. In particular, um, Xi Jinping, uh, President of China has put forward this idea of a new model of great power relations between the U.S. and China, which the, the administration has embraced. Um, Vice President Biden, uh, Susan Rice, John Kerry <coughs> have all embraced this idea and said we want to implement it. The problem is that in Japan in particular, but in other parts of Asia, this looks like a U.S.-China condominium. Um, uh, and so the administration is going to have to try to find a way to explain um, its priorities, how, um, how it wants to strengthen ties with allies, but also cooperate with China. Um, it's a tricky balancing act, and it's a little bit off kilter right now. Um, TPP is also stalled. Matt will say a bit more about that. We're particularly stuck in the U.S.-Japan negotiations in this 12-member negotiation uh, to create a Trans-Pacific partnership. Um, beef, pork, rice, sugar, things like that. Um, 
There are no big deliverables on this trip. Um, there will be an agreement in the Philippines. On the security side, Maria might say something about. Um, but there's no big treaty or, 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 or deliverable, at least that the White House has given a hint about. And so the message is going to be very important, the narrative that the President builds uh, in his speeches or joint statements. Um, uh, my sense is that the Japanese would like the President to give a very clear statement on the importance of democratic values and alliances, um, of course cooperation with China, um, but to clarify after the new model of great power relations um, discussions that the U.S. is really um, focused on rule of law, democracy. Um, uh, that's a good theme. The question is, where does the President do this speech? The speech won't be in Japan or Korea. It's either going to be in the Philippines or Malaysia. A full-throated speech on democracy and values in Malaysia is a little risky. Um, uh, Philippines may be easier. So where the President does the speech is something of great interest to me. And I think the entire region will, will be watching to see how he describes um, what this rebalance is aiming towards. Uh, presumably, the theme will be something about a rule of law based um, Asia that's win win, but, um, but all of the region will be watching to see where the emphasis is. In Japan, a few quick points. Um, I think the President will uh, probably uh, emphasize some of these themes uh, with Prime Minister Abe. He hasn't had a lot of quality time with Abe, they've had fairly short meetings. So I think one important opportunity with this um, longer trip is to spend time getting to sit down with Abe and talk things through. There have been a lot of press stories about how the two leaders don't quite click. Um, having been in the White House and been in these summits, the press doesn't always understand whether relationships click, but often the press can sense when something's not quite right. So I think quality time with Abe is important. Um, will the President do a joint statement in Japan? I don't know. I think it would be useful to try to clarify the importance of alliances and our commitment. The uh, Defense Guidelines Review, uh, revising our defense uh, guidance for U.S. and Japanese forces is a big theme this year for the U.S.-Japan Alliance. It's supposed to be done by December, um, and that will be important. Um, Korea-Japan relations have been a problem. Um, I think the President helped himself quite a bit in The Hague when he uh, orchestrated a trilateral meeting with Pakune of Korea and Abe of Japan. But there are a lot of landmines in that relationship. And it's not clear that since The Hague, uh, Korea and Japan have, have, have moved towards a dialogue uh, quite yet. Um, and then TPP, which I think uh, last October, um, people in Japan, maybe many people in the US thought would be the deliverable for the President's trip to Japan, a trans-Pacific architecture that locks in 21st century rules. Um, betting is against any breakthrough. Um, the Japanese side uh, argues that uh, the President's not willing to make the case for trade promotion authority or fast track. So why should Japan take a hit and do all the hard politics? The U.S. side is arguing Japan is getting more rigid on, on agriculture, an area that Japan knows it has to liberalize because the average farmer in Japan is 65 years old. Um, the betting is against it, but I, I would end by saying this. Um, when the President cancels his trip, uh, Matt Goodman and I wrote a piece in the Post saying the President ought to reschedule in April, and the administration did. <laughs> when they announced the trip, uh, they didn't include Korea, so Victor Cha and I, with Rich Armitage, wrote a piece in the Washington Post saying they ought to include Korea, and they did. <laughs> and Matt Goodman and I have a post out saying they ought to finish TPP on this trip. So most of the betting is against it, but by the CSIS op-ed barometer, maybe there's a chance. Two for three, it's not good. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Victor Cha, uh, our Korea Chair and Senior Advisor, is going to uh, go next. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, um, so after, uh, after Japan, the President will go to Korea. Uh, he'll be there probably uh, the afternoon, uh, the 25th, uh, have a, uh, um, a meeting and a, a good long dinner with President Park, and then leave the morning of the 26th. Uh, the, the, the two leaders um, have a very good rapport, uh, President Park and President Obama, uh, in all of their previous meetings. Um, they do, I think, at a personal level, like each other. Um, uh, I would agree with Mike that I don't think that there are uh, many policy deliverables on this trip overall, as well as in Korea. Uh, but still, um, I think it's a very important trip. Uh, for uh, for three reasons. Um, the first is the timing of the trip. 
Um, as Mike said, this is this is kind of the makeup trip for the uh, missed trip to APEC uh, last year. Uh, it's also important because it's coming on the heels of uh, the the uh, the meeting among the three leaders, the three allies at the Hague, um, President Park, President Obama, and and Prime Minister Abe, and so um, at least. In terms of optics and messaging, it's important to sort of keep that uh, signal going of uh, this trilateral coordination, given the difficulties that we've seen uh, in Korea-Japan relations, particularly uh, between the two leaders. So, you know, after the Hague, having the president be in Japan with Prime Minister Abe, and then Korea right after that, I think is important to sort of keep this, try to keep the momentum going, keep the ball rolling in terms of. Uh, re-establishing strong communication channels and sort of uh, a fluid relationship among these three countries. I think that the timing is also important because of um, the fact that the region does, I think, feel like there's a bit of distraction here in the United States. Uh, uh, in polite company, people won't say it, but behind closed doors, I think they'll openly ask where the pivot is. They don't know where it is or the rebalance um, in the second term. And so being out there present, uh, strong messaging on U.S. commitment to the region, I think, is an important way to try to compensate or try to fill that, that, uh, that gap. Um, the timing is also important because of uh, the events in Crimea. Um, <coughs> uh, I think there are some in the region that uh, see what has happened in Crimea and they worry about a so-called demonstration effect in Asia that there might be others who believe that uh, it really doesn't matter how much power you have. What really matters is whether you have the first mover advantage and whether you have the political commitment. And if you have both of those things, then you may be able to pull off fait accompli actions um, uh, without suffering uh, much in terms of uh, punishment. So um, again, I think in polite company, uh, folks may not say this openly, but uh, you know, I certainly worry that North Korea might feel like uh, it's learned something from the Crimea example. It could seize a couple of islands in the West Sea and see if they can uh, uh, they can pull off their own fait accompli. So, having the president in the region sending strong messages, you know, not directly addressing this, but just being there and talking and being with all the allies, I think, is a helps to shape the strategic environment in which nobody comes up with crazy ideas like this possibly in Asia. Um, the second reason I think that the trip is important despite the absence of deliverables is um, deterrence and defense, so kind of related to the first. Uh, on the Korean Peninsula in particular, the President will be there a week after the conclusion of US ROK, annual US ROK uh, military exercises. Um, for those of you who follow this closely, the, these exercises this year in particular have been distinguished by the fact that the North Koreans have been consistently doing um, uh, missile tests and live-fire artillery exercises uh, during these exercises. Um, we know that the North Koreans always complain about these exercises and do things before and after them, but this year has been particularly interesting because they've uh, launched or tested about, by our count, about 90 uh, missiles ranging from uh, short-range ballistic missiles to anti-ship missiles. And then last week they did a live fire artillery exercise and uh, uh, firing over 500 artillery shells and some of them landing in South Korean waters. Um, so uh, again, I think the, the, um, the meeting between the two leaders will be an important moment to show strength in the alliance, a uh, strong show of deterrence. Uh, and that will also be important for helping to um, stabilize uh, the region. The final um, reason I think that this trip is important, despite the lack of major deliverables, is because there's a lot of homework <laughs> in the bilateral relationship between the between the United States and Korea. Um, OPCON transfer, uh, the, the United States and South Korea by 2015 are supposed to transfer wartime operational control over um, South Korean forces back to South Korea. Um, uh, the South Koreans have started talking about asking for a delay in that transition given the events on the ground. 
Um, and I don't expect any announcement on a delay in OPCON transition, but I certainly think that we'll hear some good words about con uh, 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 about um, conditions based, about focusing the two militaries focusing on the right conditions for um, for turning this back to the South Koreans. And my guess is that eventually there will be a, another delay, uh, but that probably work its way through to October when you have the major annual U.S.-South Korean uh, military meetings. Um, the one two, three agreement, the United States and South Korea are in the middle of a big renegotiation uh, of the civil nuclear agreement between them. Um, I don't expect to see any major announcements on this, but I, th I certainly think behind closed doors the two leaders will be discussing their two positions on the one two, three agreement. They, they, there is a, they are, in a sense, they're, they're deadlocked. They don't have an agreement on how to revise this thing, and, and so I think there will certainly be discussion about that. Uh, imp full implementation of CHORUS, the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement, I think will another, be another high agenda item, particularly on the U.S. side. Um, so U.S. businesses have some complaints about full implementation on the Korean side of elements of CHORUS. Um, and um, that, of course, is important because Korea has not just for the U.S.-Korea FTA, but it's also important because Korea has expressed an interest in joining TPP. You know, whenever, whenever we get TPP, uh, they're very interested in becoming one of the first major industrial economies to sign on to TPP post-agreement. Um, uh, base realignment issues. Um, the U.S. and South Korea just finished their negotiations on cost sharing for the special measures agreement, cost sharing for uh, U.S. forces in Korea. So I'm sure the President will say some good words about that agreement being done. Uh, and then, of course, China. Um, uh, there seems to be a narrative of, I've heard here in town among some folks that's, that uh, Park geun uh, the South Korean President, is growing closer and closer to China. Um, <clears throat> I, I think uh, she certainly is very interested in a deeper strategic relationship with China, and if you look at the, all the different dialogues they've set up, they're clearly interested in doing that. Uh, but this, I don't think, is at the expense at all of the U.S.-South Korean relationship. This isn't a throwback to the uh, days of um, uh, No Mu Hyun, when there w the, a pro progressive South Korean president, where there was active talk about um, uh, about balancing, the Korean, Korea balancing between um, the United States and China. Nevertheless, I think um, uh, President Park will want to, will be explaining to President Obama about what her ideas are in terms of strategic engagement with China. And I think at the same time, President Obama will be talking to President Park about what the United States means when they adopt China's language of a new type of new model of great power relations. I know that there's been a slight variation on that, but I think many in the region are concerned when the United States uh, adopts the same language that the Chinese use in terms of new model of great power relations. <coughs> the United States may have a different meaning for that, uh, but for many in the region, when they hear the Chinese use it, they see that as meaning great power condominium. Um, at the expense of alliance relationships and partnerships for the United States in the region. That's clearly what the United States does not mean by it, but I'm sure that allies, President Park included, will be asking President Obama about um, uh, what, what the significance of this terminology is in his mind. Um, so with that, I'm happy to turn it over to the next stop. Yeah. Murray. Um, thanks, thanks, Andrew. Um, so I'm going to talk about Malaysia and the Philippines. Um, on Malaysia, the, the trip is significant just because it's happening. No U.S. president has visited since 1966 when Lyndon Johnson stopped there, so it's been quite a while. Uh, they're going to the president and Prime Minister Najib. Our, uh, the relations have really improved between the two countries under these two guys, and so uh, the, uh, both at, on the security, economic, and uh, political, people-to-people -people sides, and so there's, they're going to celebrate some of these, um, this improvement of relations. Um, what I'm told by the administration is the president is not going to give a speech in Southeast Asia either, uh, although he's going to have a, two opportunities in Malaysia where he, he won't be a full-throated 30-minute thing, but it'll be just, you know, five-minute comments, at very short comments twice. 
in which he's going to talk about the region, the importance of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN and the East Asia Summit, both of which Malaysia hosts next year. Um, uh, you're, you're going to, and he's also going to talk a little bit about the, the rebalance uh, in Malaysia, I understand. Obviously, the South China Sea, of which Malaysia and the Philippines are both uh, disputants with China, is going to come up. Uh, Malaysia has always uh, tried to, uh, to stay out of the, the, the fray, uh, unlike the Philippines and Vietnam, which have been dragged in more. But late last year, China had an exercise off uh, James Shoal, which is 80 kilometers, 50 miles off, off the coast of Sarawak. Uh, in eastern Malaysia, uh, you're, so uh, the, and then uh, this year sent a, a three vessels uh, right off the coast of uh, right off James Shoal also. So the the um, Malaysians have uh, slowly gotten themselves more involved in the South China Sea uh, issue also. Um, mill to mill relations have improved pretty dramatically also under under Najib. Uh, you may recall that in 2010, after uh, Najib saw Obama here in Washington, he, um, he agreed to send uh, troops, uh, military troops, doctors, to Afghanistan, which was pretty dramatic for a, a Muslim country. Um, he's going to talk about, uh, about uh, democracy, civil society, and Malaysia as a model of how a multi-ethnic country uh, functions. Uh, this is particularly important uh, because uh, about a month ago, Anwar Ibrahim, the leader of the opposition, was, uh, was sentenced for the second time on sodomy charges. Uh, this is an effort to really take him out before a very key election was to happen uh, at, at a state level. And the, uh, another opposition leader, Karpal Singh, was charged with sedition. So there's obviously human rights issues that the president is going to want to talk about, but he's got to do it a little bit subtly because there's a bunch of other, they're trying to do a, a, a complex relationship with Malaysia, not only focus on human rights. Uh, they're going to talk about trade and investment issues. Uh, Malaysia is, is a member of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Najib has uh, been under a lot of domestic pressure on, on, on the TPP uh, since the elections last June. And um, so I think the president will probably try to find ways to encourage and support him in, in his efforts. Uh, to to get the TPP going, assuming that uh, U.S. and Japan can can um, can get get to an agreement on on their disputes, um, I guess the um, uh, you know uh, I guess the the last thing we should talk about uh, I'll mention is Malaysia 370, the Mal Malaysian Airlines 370, the missing plane. Um, Initially, Malaysia did a rather lousy job of coordinating uh, its messaging and coordinating its intel and military uh, uh, search for, for the plane. That's really changed rather dramatically after about four or five days, uh, despite some of the rhetoric still coming out of China. But um, I think one, one of the things that's, that has been sharpened in the mind of Malaysians is that they, they need to cooperate more on in, intel sharing, on mill-to-mill -mill cooperation with their neighbors. The U.S. has been very involved in the search. And so uh, I don't know that we can expect the president to offer anything new unless the plane is found or there's some more, more evidence is found what exactly happened to the plane. But, but right now, they'll probably talk about you know, how, how, how the search has uh, has uh, boosted uh, uh, cooperation between the two countries. So then he goes to the Philippines. Uh, this is the last Asian ally in Asia that, uh, last U.S. ally in Asia that the, uh, Obama hasn't visited. One of the things he'll probably do is talk about how the former, uh, the longtime sick economy of Asia is now the second fastest growing after China for the last few years. Uh, he's going to probably laud, Obama will probably laud uh, Aquino for uh, his efforts on corruption and other, other issues. Uh, this visit will probably have more of a security focus, uh, as Mike already alluded to, than Malaysia. Uh, uh, there is the effort at, the, at negotiating an enhanced defense agreement, which would allow more troops, planes, ships to, uh, U.S. planes, troops, ships to move through the Philippines. Um, uh, this has been stuck. There are negotiations right now, again, uh, uh, with an effort to try and complete this agreement before the president visits. The issue, it's really 
there's a couple of issues, but the key one that they're bogged down over is the access that the Filipinos would have to areas of the bases that the U.S. Filipino bases uh, that the U.S. is going to upgrade as part of this. Uh, this is in the context you probably know in the in the in the early 90s, 91, the Philippines uh, uh, pushed the U.S. out of two bases at Subic and Clark. Um, uh, the other, uh, and, and there, the U.S. has really stepped up military aid in, uh, with the Philippines. There are two different packages of 40 and 50 million dollars that are happening this year. There's been some Coast Guard cutters. There's a third one going to be given to the Philippines. Uh, this, I think it's arriving this year, uh, early next year. Uh, they're going to talk a little bit about the shared sacrifice in World War II. Uh, Obama is going to pay homage to the Philippine veterans of the war, which there are many. Uh, Haiyan, the typhoon that hit Philippines, will probably not be a big deal. Time has passed, but they'll probably talk about the importance of continued economic cooperation. Um, the Philippines, like Korea, is talking of trying to maybe get into the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, in the second tranche at, at, once it's completed. Uh, Philippines has some big problems to, before it could join, including uh, there's constitutional bans on investment in a, a foreign investment in a bunch of different areas. Um, and then, obviously, the South China Sea will be uh, a very big deal in the Philippines. Uh, Philippines has sort of been at the front line more than anybody else uh, as China has become more assertive in the South China Sea. In 2011, the, uh, the, uh, the Chinese naval vessel tried to ram a, a, a Philippine uh, exploration vessel in Reed Bank which is just off the coast of, of uh, the Philippines. 2012, uh, the Chinese took over Scarborough Shoal, which uh, is a, f a very fertile fishing area. Um, after they had agreed that the, both sides would withdraw, the Chinese stayed, Philippines withdrew. Uh, and then in 2013, uh, there was the second Thomas Shoal where the Chinese vessels blocked uh, the Filipinos from resupplying some of their troops, five or so, half a dozen troops that are on an, an old uh, rusting uh, uh, naval vessel. Um, and then the China has also put a lot of pressure on the Philippines over its, its taking, the, uh, taking a case to, the international, to an international tribunal, uh, the, uh, which will challenge China on, uh, on, on the nine dash line and also uh, try to get the uh, International Tribunal to, uh, to weigh in on what is exactly a feature uh, that can be considered territory. A lot of the territories uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, including Second Thomas Shoal, which is basically 60 feet underwater even at high tide, it really doesn't, uh, a low tide doesn't really, uh, 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 you know, they're going to try and get the International Tribunal to, to weigh in on this issue and hopefully put some pressure on China. So that's a quick uh, overview of what's going to happen in the Philippines and Malaysia. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, th there are a lot of you here, so I think in the interest of time, I'm going to be very brief uh, since China is actually not a stop on the trip. Uh, and uh, we'll try to get to, to your questions as quickly as we can. Uh, they're not a stop on the trip, but of course they're the light motif that's going to be running through the uh, through the trip. And I think the thing that both Beijing and those of us who watch it all closely will be watching is: is it going to be a, a very obvious light motif? In other words, will the president be you know saying the C word China uh, on a regular basis throughout the trip, or will it be more of an implicit uh, light motif running through the trip? And I think that's very important because we're getting very clear signals at this stage. I think uh, from recent statements by very senior Chinese leaders, that there's deep concern about whether or not the president will repeat some of the style of remarks that has been coming out of various administration officials, which have been much more forthright um, in, in criticizing uh, China's behavior, especially in the South China Sea and elsewhere. So there's a sense that while uh, Evan Medeiros from the NSC or Assistant Secretary Russell have said some of these things, and now even Secretary Hagel, I think in his uh, news conference was rather uh, pointed with uh, his counterpart from China. Uh, there's still a question about whether the president will uh, speak in this manner, and I think that makes a big difference. So obviously China is watching this very closely, and I think to forestall some of that, they have been 
seeking to draw their line as brightly as they can uh, in the last few days uh, on this issue. So, for example, we had the Chinese ambassador here to the United States, Tsui Tian Kai, give a speech yesterday at the U.S. Institute of Peace, where he clearly uh, mentioned uh, a heavy emphasis on China's core interests, including territorial sovereignty and integrity. So the message is not to be lost. So to some degree between the two sides right now, we have, I think, the U.S. trying to send very, very clear signals to China, as uh, Victor slightly alluded to, don't miscalculate and assume that something like Crimea gives you some sort of opportunity. Uh, you know, we will uh, defend our allies. And likewise, the Chinese are coming and saying we're not going to give on territorial sovereignty and integrity. So this is an important component. Um, likewise, I think, uh, as uh, both Mike and Victor have alluded to, the new type of uh, the Chinese call it major country relations in English, but the Chinese hasn't changed its new style of great power relations. Uh, and, uh, you know, the ability of the how the administration chooses to define that on this trip, both in the private meetings, but also publicly in any statements uh, the president might uh, say as he's asked questions, I think, by local media about this, will be watched very carefully uh, by the Chinese, because uh, with Vice President Biden having effectively endorsed the concept during his visit um, in December of last year, I think then followed by these harsher statements coming from various administration officials, there's some confusion on the Chinese side as to exactly where uh, this all sits. My sense also is that if the administration is wise on this trip, they'll have to think very carefully about how they're going to manage the narrative that you all undoubtedly will uh, will be uh, putting out in coverage of this trip to how to design it in such a way that it doesn't it won't be perceived as the anti-China containment tour, basically. Uh, and I think that's very important to get the messaging right on that, uh, not only for the U.S.-China relationship, but also for the signals we're sending in the region. Likewise, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for the administration on this trip to paint its own narrative with regard to its presence in the region, what it's trying to do in the region, and to highlight, probably without direct mention of China, that unlike what seems to be happening in China's approach to the region, where is that there is this uncomfortable duality between trying to improve relations with the uh, regional neighbors while at the same time aggressively and assertively defending their sovereignty, the U.S. message is we're here as a force of peace and stability, trade, you know, et cetera, working with our, closely with our allies. And I think that's a nice opportunity for messaging uh, that could happen on this trip. Uh, obviously, the Chinese are disappointed that the president is not uh, making a stop in China uh, on this trip, but I think they understand uh, the decision that's been made. But it does, I think, then mean that they'll be watching every word coming out of him uh, very, very closely. So I think I'll stop there and turn it over to Matt. I have my own toy here. Uh, is that working? Yeah. Um, so I'll uh, just be very brief because uh, economics has already been touched on and just make uh, the, the standard three points. Um, first is that I, I think with one possible caveat, which I'll come back to, uh, this trip will not be heavily focused on economics and certainly not in terms of uh, deliverables with that one caveat, which I'll come back to. Uh, but uh, economics and specifically TPP uh, is at the heart of the rebalancing strategy. And um, it is so for kind of three broad reasons. First, because uh, it's where the growth and jobs are, as um, Willie Sutton said, it's where the money is, and that's why we go to Asia. Um, second, because it's what Asians want. Uh, they want us to be there in other aspects as well, but not only um, in a security or political sense. They also want us there economically to balance uh, that overall um, posture. And thirdly, importantly, because it's where, and Mike touched on this, uh, because TPP is at the center of the rulemaking um, um, process. In fact, uh, certainly in the international economic sphere, uh, TPP is the uh, center uh, point of uh, rulemaking in, in the world, and uh, not just in the region. And uh, so it is absolutely uh, central to the theme of of uh, establishing leadership in uh, the global rules making uh, process. Okay, so second point is that this uh, every stop on this trip uh, has a TPP nexus. Uh, Malaysia is a member, as as uh, Murray said, and Korea and the Philippines are probably the next two countries in line uh, for uh, joining TPP if it gets done in in a second uh, a tranche of members, uh, but. Uh, Japan and the U.S. are really the uh, the central uh, 
center of gravity in the TPP, simply from economic uh, point of view, they represent about 75, 80 percent of the, of the group of 12 countries in economic uh, GDP terms. Um, and within the U.S.-Japan uh, discussions, uh, as, as Mike again has alluded, uh, there are some very, there, there is very little difference of view on the rules. Uh, the U.S. and Japan actually agree on most of the rulemaking aspects of TPP. The issues or the disputes or debates are about uh, market access, particularly in agriculture and automobiles. And uh, so those are the central uh, issues that uh, uh, that uh, Mike Frum and the USTR and his counterpart um, Akira Amari are working on as are their negotiators um, as we speak. Um, and uh, if the U.S. and Japan can reach agreement, uh, including possibly before this trip, which is my third point in a second, uh, then, uh, then it will probably uh, have a very uh, important dynamic effect in the rest of the negotiations. And I, I think that most people would, would uh, think that that the rest of the TPP issues, while they are challenging and difficult, will probably fall away pretty quickly if the U.S. and Japan can agree. So the third point is that this is one of these rare moments, uh, one of these uh, kind of golden opportunities in, uh, uh, certainly in U.S.-Japan relations, to try to, uh, U.S.-Japan economic relations, uh, to try to get something big and, and important done. Uh, and I would say I agree with Mike that I think that the, uh, the best betting is that it will probably not get done. Uh, that is, the, the U.S. and Japan will probably not uh, come to agreement in the next 10 days uh, before the President visits, and certainly not while he's there. Uh, but uh, certainly if uh, this, the pressure of this trip does sometimes produce um, uh, a concentration of minds, and uh, it is possible that that uh, that there could be a political deal. It's going to depend on uh, President Obama and Prime Minister Abe personally uh, deciding to spend uh, some fairly significant political capital on both sides uh, to get it done. Uh, but uh, the betting would probably be against it, and certainly the both administrations are trying to lower expectations. Um, but uh, this is. Uh, one of those one of those rare moments, and I think both sides understand that. Uh, but but the issues are very difficult, so I'll stop there. Microphones around the room, so if you're, there's a microphone near you, there's a microphone near you. Please uh, speak into the microphone, identify yourselves and your news organizations. Uh, Ryan and Annie in the back have microphones and can bring them to you. Uh, it'll help very much with the transcript, which will be available later today uh, at CSIS.org. Um, can I, and we'll also send it out on Twitter for those of you not following us on Twitter, it's at CSIS. Uh, let's take a few questions. Yes, right in the back over here. Thank you for this one. Uh, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Is it on? We got, we got too many. All the new technology. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for doing this. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Green. Um, uh, I'm Jun Kaminishikawara with Kyodo News. Um, what are the criteria uh, for you to say? this trip is successful uh, or for you to say that uh, he's really serious about the pivot or rebalance uh, strategy because uh, I don't think we can expect much from uh, TPP negotiations or uh, there's still tensions between uh, US, uh, Japan and South Korea or uh, in the region over the history issues and still uh, I think some allies in the region are kind of apparently skip, skeptical uh, about the U.S. commitment to uh, defend their um, uh, allies, I mean, the countries, uh, because uh, of the U U situation on Ukraine. Thank you. The, um, the president could, get an, could have gotten or may yet get an A for this trip if he can finish TPP with Japan. Um, he's going to have to pull a nighter because um, uh, the semester is almost over. But, um, but, a, but a TPP agreement with Japan would have unlocked everything we were 
um, including, by the way, China, because within China the debate has shifted since Japan decided to join the TPP negotiations. A year and a half ago, Chinese senior officials were arguing this was a containment strategy. Now, increasingly, you hear economic officials in China argue this is like the WTO in the 90s. It's the way that China can, can, can help accelerate reform from without and eventually join since TPP is uh, officially considered a building block towards a free trade area of the Asia Pacific. So it would unlock so many things politically, economically, and strategically. Um, I personally think the President hasn't invested the political capital in it enough to date to get it done. <coughs> um, and uh, Prime Minister Abe has backed off a bit as well. But it's still possible. That would be an A. Um, I'm an easy grader. Um, I think uh, short of that, um, the administration has an opportunity um, to get its narrative right about Asia. Um, in 2009, in the visit to China, the President and, Ch and Hu Jintao agreed that we would respect U.S. and Chinese core interests, which sounded like a bipolar condominium, U.S.-China-centered policy. And then in 2010, Hu Jintao and the President issued a statement, or 2011 in January, which took that out. Um, and, and, and now the new model of great power relations has come back. Um, so it's a very delicate balancing act for any administration, Clinton, Bush, or Obama, to show you want to cooperate with China, but you're solidly behind your allies. And you, and you have to do both. And I think the administration has gotten in trouble because they've switched from one to the other. And it's kind of gone back and forth. So the president has an opportunity to sort of set a narrative that makes it clear we're doing both at the same time. I do not think, and I know the Japanese media is setting the bar high, I do not think the president has to repeat or go beyond what Secretary Hagel or Danny Russell or Evan Maduro said. They, they made the U.S. commitment to the security relationship with Japan clear. I don't think you should expect the president to go beyond that. But I do think that it would be useful for the president um, to make some clear statements about what, not, you know, much of the pivot is discussed in terms of process. How many meetings, how many ships. Um, I think that president's really got to say, what is the American bottom line in Asia? And that's that we want a rule-based uh, order um, where um, our allies are already on side, where democratic values and rule of law count for us, but where it's going to be a win-win and we want China and every nation to be part of it. But that kind of comprehensive vision is, 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 is the second thing I'd look for. Um, if he can do that, I think he'll get a, a, a gentleman's B. Is it a gentleman's B? Um, he'll do pretty well. Okay, um, we've got Mark. Uh, thanks. It's uh, Mark Landler from the New York Times. Um, Mike, you just kind of got at what I was going to ask you about, um, which is puzzling to me, which is this sort of seeming conflict between a U.S.-China condominium and a major power relationship on the one hand, and then this kind of counterbalancing strategy the U.S. seems to have been pursuing for the past few years. So I guess what I would, I'd ask is, when you talk about this flipping back and forth, do you think that reflects a genuine debate within the administration about what kind of relationship we want with China, or do you think it reflects a lack of high-level consistent administration involvement with Asia, which leads to things like Biden going out and having one kind of an encounter with Xi Jinping, and then Evan Medeiros giving an interview that has a very different tone. So is it, a, is it a, like a theological debate or just a lack of attention? It's a cleverly designed strategy to confuse our adversaries. <laughs> um, I think in general, since the mid-90s, um, the Clinton administration and then Bush, who I worked for, and Obama, have basically followed the same course, as I mentioned, which is to try to expand trust and cooperation with China, but at the same time double down on your allies and partners to make it clear what the rules of the road should be in Asia. Um, and, you know, Clinton did this, Bush did this. Um, I think the reason that the administration has sort of switched from one to the other is uh, too often, in my view, my colleagues may disagree, they've treated summits or bilateral issues with China or with Japan as one-offs, as bilateral issues. And they haven't paid enough attention to how they shape the entire region and the entire region's impression of the U.S. And that's why you have these changes. In general, I think they're very much within the um, strategy that uh, has bipartisan support that has continued from Clinton through Bush. Um, uh, that's a part of the problem. And it is personality dependent. I mean, uh, I'm not giving away a great secret, and the journalists from Asia and the region will know, people thought Hillary Clinton was very focused on Asia. 
Um, uh, but the president, my sense is, you know, having worked for Bush for almost five years, the president probably really understands this. It, you know, being president is like a PhD a day <laughs> in terms of the amount of interaction you have with leaders and the intelligence briefings. And so I'm somewhat optimistic that President Obama will be able to set the right tone, um, which everyone will take very seriously because it's not a cabinet secretary or an assistant secretary, it's the president. So I hope, I don't know what the plan is for a speech, but I hope he uses the opportunity to set his vision for the region to, to clear this up. Chris may want to. Yeah, I, I think, Mike, you pretty much hit it on the head. But I think the key question is, is what you said yourself, which is the issue of consistency. And for Beijing, that's the most important issue. Uh, in, the, in, in the years of our relationship since the normalization of relations, the core thing the Chinese want out of the relationship is consistency. And in fact, if you are consistent, they'll be willing to have you push them occasionally on things that are sensitive or where there are areas of dispute. It's where you're not consistent and they're not sure what you're going to do next uh, that causes them great amount of consternation and then oftentimes causes them, frankly, to be pushier uh, in the relationship because they feel that they've got to push back in order to establish that sort of consistency. So if we won't do it, they'll try to do it for us. I think that's uh, the important issue there. Um, Likewise, I think uh, more broadly in the region, there is this issue that Mike alluded to, which is getting that narrative set so that people can stop wondering what the narrative is. And so, for example, with the vice president's visit, if you're going to uh, embrace the phraseology of a new style of major country relations with the Chinese, I think you would have to think not only about what does that do with my bilateral relationship with China, but how will it affect the whole region's view of what we're doing? Because we have to remember that each of these statements are not simply in a bilateral context. The regional partners and allies and friends are drawing their own conclusions about what these things mean. So that then, I think, requires the administration to think very thoughtfully about how do we pre-brief, how do we back brief on what we've been doing, you know, these kind of things. And uh, I presume they're doing that, but uh, it is something where our allies and friends need constant reassurance on these points. And so I think, you know, before you're going to do something in the bilateral context, you have to think about what the broader implications are for the region. I, I think what my colleague said are, is entirely correct. I mean, to the extent, is this a theological debate? It's been a theological debate in every administration. Do you work China from the outside in or from the inside out? And I think, um, uh, you know, I think for this administration, they they basically have to figure out whether they see continued U.S. Le the legitimacy of continued U.S. leadership in Asia resting on the alliance relationships as the core, or the China relationship as the core. And I think that when they're preparing for a bilateral summit with China, they think it's that, right? When they're preparing for the Allies trip, then they think it's the Allies trip. And that's why you get all these mixed messages and the region not really sure, so. Uh, Jeff Dyer from the Financial Times. A question for Mike. Just wonder if you could tell us what you think the considered view now is of in Washington of Prime Minister Abe. On the one hand, he's doing lots of the things the U.S. has always wanted China, uh, Japan to do in terms of uh, you know, changing the rules or surrounding the Japanese military. But the other hand, you've had the Yasukuni Shrine visit, some people publicly suggesting that he's dragging the U.S. into the fight. So what, what, what do you think is now the considered view on him? When you say in Washington, do you really mean in Washington or do you mean the administration? The administration? Well, I'm, of course, I'm divining from conversations. I think the view of Abe improved considerably um, after his visit here uh, last February, a year ago. Um, deteriorated somewhat after Yasukuni shrine visit because Vice President Biden seems apparently thought he had a commitment that, that Prime Minister Abe would go. I personally find that very difficult to believe. I cannot imagine that, that sorry, the, the Vice President Biden came away from his visit uh, rep reportedly uh, thinking he had a commitment from Prime Minister Abe that Abe would not go to the Yasukuni Shrine. I personally find that very hard to believe. Uh, knowing Abe and knowing Japanese politics, I can't imagine that the Japanese Prime Minister would make a commitment like that, given the sensitivity of this issue. Um, uh, so that d deteriorated somewhat. I think my sense is that the, that the, uh, the view is on the upswing, generally. I mean, Prime Minister Abe has said now in the Diet that he will keep, will stick to the official apologies for the war, and for the comfort women, the so-called Muriyama and Kono statements from the mid-1990s. Um, he himself, his cabinet, has said and done very little to stir up these issues. Um, several um, 
uh, Japanese um, appointed to the board of NHK or advisory boards by the Diet have not been so disciplined in their message. And so um, there's still plenty of fodder for the FT or the New York Times and especially the Korean and Chinese press from these people who were associated with the Prime Minister. But he himself is generally in his own uh, statements and in his cabinet statements has been very careful. And the trilateral with Pak Geun-hye helped um, considerably. Um, the other aspect of this, of course, is um, the, 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 I think that the Chinese uh, strategy is, um, uh, you know, they, 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 uh, Beijing succeeded against the Philippines fairly well and basically took the Scarborough Shoals. Um, and the Philippines are feisty and they're fighting back in, in the International Court of Justice. Um, which, uh, which is important. Um, Japan's a much harder uh, target. Uh, and I, th I think uh, the Chinese strategy is to uh, pressure Japan by um, casting doubt in the Americans' minds about the reliability of Japan. And so you will frequently hear Chinese officials say that Japan will drive us into a, you know, the tail wags the dog, Japan will pull us into a fight. Um, um, I don't think that the administration buys that. That's my sense. I think th that strategy may have worked six months or a year ago. I don't think the administration buys it. And in fact, there's a lot more um, joint planning and stuff um, to deal with the kind of so-called gray zone contingencies from uh, non-kinetic, non-warfare pressures from ships patrolling and planes flying in the East China Sea. Uh, Margaret Talev with Bloomberg News. So I was really interested in a little bit more on the security side, both this idea of Ukraine and what that signals to Asia and how Obama should thread the needle. Um, I'm sort of curious, is, is China more like Russia or <laughs> more not like Russia in this scenario? And it, is Obama signaling also to the Uyghurs and to, to the Tibetans? If so, what's he signaling to them? Uh, is he more concerned about some rogue North Korean move or more concerned about some China move? Um, and then if I can do my multiple question question. Um, uh, on, the, on the military uh, side, um, I'm interested in if you can put a little more meat on the bone about um, the Philippines. Are we looking at something akin to what we did with Australia in terms of the exercises and how that affects China. Um, and how does Obama um, pump up the U.S.-Philippines relationship without inadvertently offending Japan and sort of blowing up the whole trip? China. Yeah, all of the above, yeah. Uh, so this is the, we, we, get, we had an event here at CSIS yesterday and got the same question. And so this is apparently the theory du jour that uh, the Chinese see the, the Crimea situation as a go signal for them to, to, to go take over the Diaoyu. I, I think this is totally wrong. It, it, it misunderstands Chinese strategic thinking and Chinese strategic culture. I, I think that the, the, what we should all be watching from the Crimea episode with regard to China is what it means for China's relationship with Russia and how they view the Russian relationship as a sort of card in the triangular relationship between ourselves, China, and Russia. And what I mean by that is I think there's a very strong debate in senior levels in the Chinese government <laughs> over the uh, amount to which uh, they should be sort of leaning toward the Russians in the relationship and having – there's a growing sense, I think, that Xi Jinping's two predecessors, Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin, focused way too much on the U.S. relationship and not enough on these other, you know, sort of major country-ish relationships. And so President Xi took, made his first visit to Russia. There's been a lot of this sort of thing. So to the degree that those who are so inclined inside the Chinese system can say Putin is strong because he got away with this, you know, largely unscathed, it strengthens the hand of those inside the system and say we should be leaning a little bit more in the direction of the Russians in this relationship. And of course the goal is to always have sort of what they call an active Russia option or card inside or under the umbrella of the management of Sino-US relations because it helps level out the power disparity between you know the US and China right at the same time I would argue you cannot have a new style of major country relations if that's the game right because then you're basically playing the old game that they've been playing for so long uh, I don't think just real quick I don't think there's any signal by Obama to the Uyghurs or Tibetans or anything like that but anyway others Say on North Korea, I think it's ent entirely about North Korea. <laughs> I mean, um, I mean, there. If you think about, it, there have been more missile and nuclear tests uh, by the North Koreans under the Obama administration than there were in two terms of Bush, and and Bush was considered the one who was, 
you know, the regime change guy and everything. And Obama's considered the engager. And we have seen much more under, nor, under Obama than we've seen under Bush. So um, I would certainly be worried about it. And then, of course, you have this leader in North Korea who, you know, he, he, he plays international relations like it's a video game. So, uh, of course, I'd be worried about um, and it. And, and we're approaching crabbing season here in, uh, not here, in, in, maybe in Maryland, but, <laughs> but in the West Sea. Uh, and so there's lots of opportunities for uh, altercations between the two sides. So I'll just talk a little bit about the Philippines. I mean, it is really very similar to what the U.S. Is, was tr trying to do. It was trying to do with Australia. So it's going to be rotating troops, uh, ship visits, uh, planes. Uh, there's going to be – they're going to uh, put a lot of um, uh, humanitarian assistance, d disaster relief supplies there uh, so they can move them more quickly. We seem to be having a lot of more incidents like Haiyan, the huge typhoon that hit the uh, Philippines late last year. Uh, I presume the Chinese will protest. I, I, Chris uh, probably has a better feel for this, th like they did over the Australia, the Darwin stuff. Uh, this is going to be small numbers of troops. Uh, they're going to be rotating through. It's probably it, it's going to increase U.S. capabilities, but it's not like it's uh, you know the uh, uh, increasing the U.S. capability to to uh, a great deal vis-a-vis -vis China, which it doesn't have already have with, uh, with the Seventh Fleet and those kind of facilities. Quick on the Philippines. We can't have a permanent base in the Philippines. It's in, in the Constitution and our own experience with Subic Bay um, uh, and Clark Airfield is, it makes us wary of that. <laughs> um, so um, this is, as, as Murray said, this is about access. It's about um, rotating Marines, air and naval. Um, it's about helping the Philippines establish um, more maritime domain awareness. Um, they don't know who's going in and out of their archipelago. So it's about that and showing the flag to back them up. <coughs> um, and it's about dispersal, frankly, that um, U.S. Um, b bases are too concentrated in a few places in Asia, um, which is not good when you're trying to help build relationships, but it's also not good when there are more ballistic missiles aimed at you. Um, and so it's about um, having a lot more access across the whole region, but not bases, um, which are expensive and politically risky uh, for the U.S. and for the Philippines. Lee from KBS. Uh, Dr. Cha mentioned the possibility of uh, North Korean provocation. So, uh, uh, would you elaborate a little bit more on the relation between the President Obama's visit to the area and the resolution of the North Korean nuclear issue? Do you think uh, uh, President Obama will show some kind of new initiative heading to dialogue or uh, contrary to the uh, enhanced uh, sanction pressure? What would be the main message during his visit to the area? Uh, well, my guess is that the conversation will go something like this, uh, both in Japan and in Korea. They'll talk about uh, whether um, uh, what's the likelihood, the prospects for returning to six-party talks, um, given um, uh, trends in North Korean behavior. I think that's going to be a pretty short conversation. Um, <laughs> And then I think a lot of the focus will be on how to prepare for and respond to the next uh, provocation. You know, I think if you if you, you know you watch the behavior since, like I said, since February 21st, they've done about 90 missile tests and they fired 500 artillery shells. Uh, the rhetoric just seems to be getting worse. And um, you know, as we hit April, May, June, th this is sort of long-range ballistic missile testing season. In addition to being crabbing season, it's <laughs> missile test season. That's right. It helps with the crabbing, as Chris said. Uh, so uh, I think that the, the conversation will really focus on, uh, you know, what's the game plan if we see more of these sorts of provocations, and and how do we respond? How do we fill in the holes in the sanctions regime um, the, to to put more pressure? And I think, <clears throat> particularly in the conversation between uh, President Park and President Obama. Uh, both of them will be discussing their, uh, their own conversations with China 
since uh, the focus always is on what China can do, and the, both the South Koreans and the U Americans have, have their own dialogues with China, I think it'll, uh, there'll, there'll be a lot of discussion about how each of their conversations are going, uh, uh, going with China. Hi, Jun Yi with China's Xinhua News Agency. Uh, may I have your comments on the status of uh, Washington's rebalance to Asia Pacific? And also, do you think that events like the Ukrainian crisis uh, will slow down or even stop uh, the period? Thank you. I think the administration is coming to realize that events on the other side of the globe have a big impact on the security dynamics within Asia. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to overstate how much the decision on Syria affected uh, thinking, especially in treaty allies like Japan and Korea, um, about the American security commitment. In fact, um, it's very different. You know, these are treaty allies where we have U.S. bases where American opinion polls show a, a significant majority of Americans say, if Japan or Korea are attacked, we should defend them. Syria was a completely different case. But what really rattled the region was um, that the president drew a red line and then threw it to Congress. And that precedent uh, was, was troubling to allies. And then, you know, the options are limited on Crimea, frankly. But it becomes part of a, a narrative, and the dots start, start getting connected. So these non-Asian events are affecting the credibility uh, uh, of American security commitments in ways that perhaps the administration didn't expect and, and that they have to compensate for. Um, uh, and 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 Hegel and others have done that. Um, I think what Secretary Hegel and other senior officials have said is is partly because of what's happening in in the Middle East or Crimea. Um, in terms of whether it will distract them away, um, you know, the rebalance of the U.S. military is not uh, increased assets in Asia. It's within a shrinking pie. Relatively more assets will go to Asia than Europe. And I think now that's going to be a harder balancing act. Um, and, um, you know, NATO is now very important again. And, uh, and it shows that you can't isolate one part of the world and then transfer your military capabilities. So I think that will raise questions in the region people will want to um, address in the President's party when he goes out there. Um, but in terms of the sustainability of the pivot, you know, the the, the, Asia is so important, as Matt said, it's where the money is, that on the trade side and on the security side, on the dip diplomatic side, there's no turning back. It, you know, it doesn't matter in a way who's Secretary of State or President, in a way. It's just too important and, and too obvious to the Congress. The largest congressional delegation in 25 years is going to Asia next week uh, during their spring recess. <laughs> um, people get it. So I think his, over the next sweep of history, uh, the, the rebalance is, has nothing to do in some ways with uh, the White House. It's the American people, American business, the Congress all get it, and it will continue. Um, there's some fine-tuning and some explaining that the President will have to do, as we've suggested. But I think the American focus on Asia is not reversible, in my view. Uh, I follow up two follow ups on one on Korea, North Korea. It's about uh, North Korea is preparing for uh, something new type, you know, their nuclear test. I uh, just one, wondering if you can uh, share with us uh, your evaluation of will that be true or if that happens, what, what will be America and their alliance response? And the second follow, follow up is about the Congress delegation to. Uh, to, to to visiting uh, to visit Asia, uh, where are they going? Thank you. Right. So North <coughs> North Korea has threatened to do a new, I guess, a new form of nuclear test. Uh, we, of course, we don't know what exactly this means. Um, uh, yeah, at least, uh, you know, sort of uh, over open source commercial imagery shows that they have done a lot of work at the nuclear test site. <laughs> Um, uh, activity. It looks like pretty innocuous activity, but my general view is anytime there's activity at a nuclear test site in North Korea, that's not good news. 
Um, um, and uh, and I think people are concerned. You know, what does a new form mean? It could be a uranium-based uh, nuclear detonation, or it could be a whole series of detonations to try to prove or demonstrate or test whether they have a range of capabilities. So either way, it's not a good sign. And in, in, in how the administration responds, you know, I think there'll be, again, we've seen this movie how many times already? There'll be a lot of pressure on China, um, not only to go on, go along with tighter UN Security Council resolutions. Uh, you know, I, I hate to say this, but it could be good for U.S.-Japan ROK trilateral coordination because uh, it'll make the threat quite imminent and quite real uh, and might be a spur to better security cooperation in spite of the difficult histories uh, among the three allies. Um, <clears throat> and, um, uh, and, you know, it also might, it might um, result in uh, some effort at on, upon, by some party, whether it's South Korea or China, some effort at negotiation, or even Japan for that matter, at negotiation, because, again, the history of this shows that when these, th this sort of crisis emerges, somebody always wants to get their hands on the North Korean to try to calm, North Koreans to try to calm things down. Um, and, and that could be China, or it could be uh, South Korea in this case, um, or even the administration. But, uh, but when the North Koreans talk about a new form of nuclear test, uh, that's something we have to be concerned about because they wouldn't be signaling something like that unless they were planning something. The, there's, a, there's a delegation of rough about 20 members going to Japan, Senate and House, and then a delegation of I think 10 or 12 or so going to Japan, Korea, China. The latter one is led by uh, Eric Cantor and Paul Ryan and very senior members of Congress. And a number of us have had a chance to brief them and talk about Asia. And, um, uh, my my uh, impression is that they're going, the message they're going to bring is that the Congress supports the rebalance and engagement of Asia and uh, they're, that they're going to be uncharacteristically bipartisan <laughs> and that uh, the, the, um, uh, the trip's a good thing. It's a very good thing. Real quick on North Korea, um, we, uh, the, the administration calls its North Korea policy strategic patience. And I, I have kids, little kids, so it's a little bit like the timeout chair. Um, and they get put in the timeout chair. But the problem is when North Korea gets put in the timeout chair, it has a chemistry set. <laughs> and it sits in the timeout chair, reprocessing plutonium and spinning centrifuges, um, and then comes back and does a test, and we put them in the timeout chair again. Um, this has been the pattern, and uh, I suspect that's probably what we'll do again. Um, what we have not done is to um, implement uh, sanctions outside of the UN Security Council process, because the UN Security Council process requires Chinese and Russian uh, agreement, and therefore everything gets watered down. And so what would be really different is if we had a coalition like we did with Iran, of the Europe, of the Europeans, the Japan, Korea, Australia, and others, to start really squeezing uh, in, in, um, in new ways to slow down these programs. Um, we've not done as much. Uh, to North Korea as we have with Iran. But I doubt that'll be the response. I think it'll be the usual uh, Security Council route. <clears throat> and the emphasis will be on keeping solidarity even if that waters down the pressure, which I personally think is no longer working very well. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Tatsuya Mizumoto from Gigi Press. Uh, I have a question about uh, the president uh, commit uh, about the U.S. commitment to allies and the region. Um, when the president going to Japan, um, <coughs> is the president going to show his support to Japanese uh, collective self-defense? And then is the president to confirm U.S. Uh, position, which is? Um, U.S. is not going to accept unilateral uh, change of status quo by China in East China Sea, South China Sea. Um, could you give us your insight? My guess is that, um, well, my hope is that the President will say something publicly in Japan supporting the reforms Prime Minister Abe is doing 
to the defense establishment, um, allowing more international armaments cooperation, <laughs> relaxing the ban on collective self-defense so that Japanese forces can operate more in a more joint and combined way with Americans or Australians. Um, I hope the President says something uh, welcoming that. The U.S. and Japan, in a joint statement last year in the 2 plus 2, said that, but that was cabinet level. Um, I, I don't think the President will use the words collective self-defense. I think it, my guess would be a, it'd be a more general endorsement. I hope he should. Um, in terms of the East China Sea, I would, my guess is, take a look at what Hegel said and then dial it down a, or make it a little vaguer. And that's probably what the President will say. There's no, for all the reasons Chris said, the President can't be tougher on the East China Sea than his cabinet. In fact, I would guess that the statements by Secretary Hegel and others were done with the intent of making it right. not necessary for the President to do such a hard um, uh, declaration of opposition. But, but he, he should, and I hope he will find some way to make it clear that in, in a broad sense he agrees with that. Um, uh, if he completely ignores what, what Abe-san is trying to do for defense reform, if he completely ignores the East China Sea issue and says nothing, that would be a failure. But I think he'll find a way to say something that shows broadly he, he's, Hegel and others are speaking on his behalf. What do you think? Thank you, Deng Hui Yu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. My, uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is for Mr. Uh, Mike. Uh, another one is for Chris. Uh, for Mr. Green, do you expect that President Obama will assume Japan on the one hand, but on the other hand will uh, encourage Mr. Abe to refrain his rhetoric and behavior and push him to improve the relationship with China. For Chris, you mentioned that uh, Beijing is going to watch c closely what President will be talking about. And, but as Mr. Murray said, Beijing may protect U.S. Philippines uh, new agreement. So how could President assure Beijing that he is not trying to contain China, even though he does not did not say any you know hard words about China. I think Vice President Biden's um, efforts to handle the history issue on his visit to Japan and Korea did not go well, um, and um, that the administration is going to try a much subtler approach. So I would not expect that President Obama will say anything about uh, history issues publicly. This will disappoint the Korean press and the Chinese press in the same way that President Obama not saying something about the East China Sea in detail will disappoint the Japanese press. Um, but, but I don't see him, it would be a mistake to think he needs to in any way appear to be lecturing the Prime Minister during a state visit to Japan. I, I, I can't imagine it. Now in the summit meeting, I can imagine a number of ways that the President could um, air this issue. <clears throat> president Bush, when we had um, a situation in 2005 when Prime Minister Kuzumi uh, had pretty bad relations with Hu Jintao, for example, um, uh, President Bush asked him privately, what's your thinking about China? It seems like there's a lot of friction. And he invited an, an explanation about how the Prime Minister thinks about these issues in the context of relations with neighbors, which is not a moral judgment, it's not lecturing, it's not criticizing, but it makes it clear that for the United States we don't have an interest in bad China-Japan relations and then in fact we have an interest, a strong interest in good Japan-Korea relations. Um, so that I can imagine him finding a way to let the Prime Minister explain his thinking to make it clear the U.S. cares about this without lecturing in private. Um, for the rest of Asia, um, it's not as much of an issue. No, no other leader in Asia uh, criticized the visit to Yasukuni. Public opinion polls about Japan and South and Southeast Asia are well over 90 percent positive. So it's largely a Northeast Asia issue. But I would not look for any kind of public uh, mentioning of this by the President. And the private one, I think, would be quite subtle. I would hope. Uh, 
I don't do it in two seconds. I, I, I think, uh, let me just make uh, a firmer statement than Murray's. The Chinese will protest heavily any announcement of new defense uh, relations with uh, with the Filipinos. I mean, the, the message is clear from the defense, from Defense Minister Chung, but also across the Chinese system. In terms of how you can portray it as uh, something not aimed at containment, uh, this is what I alluded to earlier in my earlier remarks, you know, that, that you, there's going to be a media narrative and you have to figure out how you want to try to shape it or define it. Uh, and I think part of the re way you do that is, especially, say, in this cooperation with the Philippines, emphasize better maritime domain awareness. You know, there's a lot of ways to describe what's happening there without, you know, sort of making reference either explicitly or implicitly to the Chinese boogeyman, for lack of a better term. Joe Morton with the Omaha World Herald. Uh, you mentioned Secretary Hagel a little bit. He just returned from the region. I was just wondering if you could expound a little on what his uh, visit and his meetings with the Japanese and Chinese, um, what you were watching there and how that um, kind of informs the Obama trip here. Um, Secretary Hagel has earned his frequent flyer miles. He's done, I've lost track, I think it's five trips now to the region. Um, four trips to the region. Um, his uh, counterparts in Asia like him. Um, he, uh, in many ways, um, from India to Japan, has become the, uh, the person associated with the pivot or with the rebalance. Um, and part of it is that he's put in a lot of miles. Part of it is, his, as a senator, he spent time on Asia, not to mention as a sergeant in the U.S. Army. Um, and part of it is he has an agenda that's moving forward with the Philippines. Um, there was a, a quiet but very important summit with a defense meeting with all the ASEAN defense ministers in Hawaii. Um, trilateral US-Japan-Korea defense talks are getting back on track to cooperate on North Korea and other things. And then the defense guidelines with Japan. So he kind of has, USTR and the Pentagon sort of have the most active agendas. And I think Mike Froman is heavily, heavily engaged, but, but the TPP part's a little bit stuck. So I think it was a good thing for the president that Secretary Hegel had a good trip. Um, and frankly, Chris may disagree, but the Chinese defense minister lecturing Secretary Hegel actually helped. It actually helped if, if you're going to go then and visit Japan and the Philippines. <laughs> There's a debate, I think, right now about whether that exchange that we saw between uh, Defense Minister Chang and Secretary Hagel was healthy, not healthy, you know, and so on. I think there's a fair case to be made on either side. I would try to thread the needle by saying that uh, if you're, this is what a new style of major country relations is supposed to be about, right, which is dialogue that brings these security tensions back under policy control, right, rather than having at a, at a cabinet or higher level, rather than having the individual militaries play these games, you know, that's how you establish a new style of major country relations, is to air these things openly like this and through dialogue bring that back under civilian, hopefully, policy control. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, my name is Kakumi Kobayashi with the Kyoto News of Japan. I have a quick question about the present trip to Japan, um, about the level of mutual understanding between the U.S. and Japanese government. I heard the, uh, the First Lady is not accompanying the President, even though the Japanese government in, is inviting the President as a top-level state guest uh, the, for the first time in nearly 20 years. Uh, so um, what, how weak should they interpret this likelihood? Is it, is it mean the Japanese government have already missed any signs from the U.S. government about the magnitude of the President trip or something? So thank you. I wouldn't read too much into it. Um, you, you know, the uh, uh, I think people on both sides of the aisle admire the Obamas for their relative work-life balance. <laughs> and uh, she took the kids to China for spring break. She had to because she didn't go to Sunnyland. And the Chinese were unhappy about that. So I wouldn't read too much into it. Um, it's a state visit. Um, and at the end of the day, I don't think it'll be an, an issue she didn't go. Unless, I mean, if, it won't be an issue, if the president does a good job framing the importance of the US-Japan alliance, framing his vision of the future of Asia and how important Japan is in it. If he does that, I don't think this is an issue. Thank you, Victor. 
Our experts will be here uh, during the trip, so if you need to uh, follow up, please do call my office. Um, thank you for coming again. This will be on CSIS.org later today, both the video of this briefing and the transcript. Thanks very much.